Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, my name is Amina. Today I'm going to be going through the precise details and practical tips on how to write a powerful abstract for your master's thesis, for your PhD thesis, for a poster presentation, just any report that you have to write an abstract for, this would be useful for it. An abstract is arguably the most important piece of writing that is first seen by the reader. So as soon as someone comes to your paper or your thesis or your document, they are going to come across the abstract first. So I'm gonna be breaking down today's video into two sections. The first is characteristics of an abstract and the second will be the content. And in order to do this, I'm going to be going through an abstract um, and showing you, because I think it's very easy for me to, to talk and to say what you need to include, but it's a different story when you actually see it in practice and see how it's done. And this video came to mind because I recently marked three or four pieces of work in a row and for all of them, the abstract was the worst bit of writing, even though the actual text itself was absolutely fine. So an abstract is usually 200 to 250 words. It can be a one long paragraph or it can be two paragraphs. It's a concise summary of what is to come in the paper or in the essay and it should inform the reader on their decision of whether or not they want to continue reading the paper. Usually I'd recommend to write the abstract last, seeing as you kind of need to know what the story of your paper is going to be. So you need to know what the results are, what your conclusion is, what your future directions are in order to write the abstract. So do not try to write it first, even though it's the first thing that you are going to include in your contents page. And essentially the purpose of an abstract, and I think this is really important, the purpose of the abstract is purely to be commentary. So you're not including any discussion or any critique, it's purely just this is what we did, these are the methods, this is the result, and these are the conclusions. Sometimes you do find abstracts that will say like our results show or in our lab or previously we have shown, even if it's your work, you don't write I um, did this or that. Okay, and moving on to the content. So what do you actually include in an abstract? Now to do this, I have pulled up, and I've got my laptop here, so I'll be looking at that. I pulled up my abstract from a paper that was published in 2014, um, and I was um, an author on this paper, and I just started my PhD, and um, this was tip a very good abstract that I used in order to construct the rest of the abstracts that I wrote during my PhD and I think it's a perfect structure and it's a perfect example of how to lay out a, a really strong, powerful abstract. The first part should be the introduction. Now this is broken up into sort of two parts. So the first sentence, the first one or two sentences should be comprehensible to anybody from any field, whether they are in science or not. The first two, one or two sentences should be a general summary of what topic it is that you are going to be discussing. And then the next sentence or two can be going into a little bit more depth. It should be able to be understood by someone who is in your field. So we're not going into any detail yet. We're just introducing the topic and giving the context of what it is that you are going to be discussing in that abstract. If we look at my abstract, you can see that the first, I would say, um, the first three sentences are the introduction. So it says that the contractile actin cortex is a thin layer of actin, myosin and protein that subtends the membrane of animal cells. Now that is something that anyone can understand whether you have a science background or not. Think of it as a funnel. You want to start from the most general part first and then go into the detail as you go along. Then the next two sentences are more detailed. So the cortex is the determinant of cell shape and has an important role in cell division, migration, um, and here are some examples. And as you can see, those first two sentences are referenced because it is a general knowledge that has been acquired not by us, not by the people that have written this, not by us, the authors, but by the knowledge in the literature. So you do need to make sure that in the first two sentences, even if you have only included one thing, if it has to be referenced, then it has to be referenced. Um, and the actual style that you use doesn't really matter. It depends on what your format is. But in this case, we've used numbers. But like I said, it doesn't actually matter. Just keep it consistent throughout the abstract and throughout the text as well. Then the second part needs to identify a gap 
in knowledge or a gap in the literature and that is the gap that you are going to be addressing now this is a sentence that i find a lot of people tend to miss out and i struggle to understand when i'm reading a piece of work if i don't see that sentence very clearly written so this could be one sentence or two sentences maximum and you have to identify the the limitation in literature the issue that is present at the moment that you are trying to solve. What is the rationale? What is the research question? What is the hypothesis? That is what that sentence needs to be. It needs to be very, very clear. Let's take a look at this um, abstract here. It says, despite its importance, we've just had three sentences describing how important the cortex is. However, although it's super important, our knowledge of the cortex is poor, so we don't actually know that much about it and the proteins that nucleate it remain unknown, which is the proteins that make up the cortex. We don't know too much about them. Um, and there are a few candidates that have been proposed. So there are some proteins that we know could be involved in the process, but we don't know enough about it. And here are the references to show the proteins that we think are involved. So straight away, even if you are someone that doesn't come from a science background, you know what the cortex is, why it's important, and what the missing bit is in literature at the moment. Now, that is a very, very strong start to an abstract, and anybody who comes across your work knows what they are going to be reading about, essentially, in your, in your essay or in your thesis. Then, the next two sections, I'm gonna kind of merge them together, so I'm gonna say section three and section four is the methods and the results. Now, depending on what your, um, your research is, you might do them separately, or you might kind of combine them together, and I'll show you how you do that so the first is the methods so what methods are you using um, are you doing qualitative quantitative surveys electron um, light microscopy like what is the method that you are, are, are using um, and then what are the main results with the results you want to focus on not every single thing that you found I mean if you're writing a thesis let's say you've got I don't know how many chapters, six, seven chapters, you can't possibly write about everything. But you do need to think about what is the main story that you want to tell? What is the main point that, or points that you've made uh, and that you found the original kind of information that you've um, identified through your, through your research that you want to portray and that you want to come across? So you can see here, we said here, we use two independent approaches to identify the nucleators. Um, so the first one is a prote proteomic analysis and the second one is a localized shRNA screen. So those are the two methods. So those are two very, very kind of strong methods. Um, and so it was quite nice to include it separately. However, a way that you could do, another way that you could do it is by saying, using, proteomic, using a proteomic analysis, we showed blah, blah, blah. So you've combined the method and the result in the same sentence, because you've said, using the proteomic analysis, you've shown this. Um, using the shRNA screen, you've shown this. So you've kind of combined it, or you can just do it separately. Like I said, it really depends. It doesn't actually matter which method you use. And then the next sentence says, this unbiased study, so you can kind of see how we've included um, methods and sort of, you, you want to promote your own work at the end of the day. So by saying it's unbiased, it shows that we haven't picked out proteins based on what we think. We've purely looked at the proteomic screen and we've just picked proteins from there. So it's not a personal opinion, it's unbiased, which is a quite nice thing to add there. You could, we could have just said this study revealed, but by saying it's unbiased, like, you know, it does add a little bit of, um, a bit of flavor, if you like. Um, so this unbiased study revealed that two proteins generated whatever, and then, so the results are from here all the way down to there. So that would, I would say is, four sentences about four sentences and those are the main results so they're kind of there were kind of two main results and I'm not going to go through it but kind of two main results again you can see there's a bit more method here as well when we say electron microscopy revealed that so we've kind of mixed methods and results a little bit and like I said that's completely fine but do make sure that you've clarified the methods that you've used in order to find um, the, 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 the results that you have um, and yeah, again, you want to use words that are emotive, so interestingly, despite not affecting division. Um, so the word interestingly is quite 
quite a good one to use. Word surprising is a good one to use if you, if it's a result that is surprising or unexpectedly, something like that that shows that what you found is not just what everyone thinks would have happened, but actually it was interesting that this happened. Um, and again, it just it just adds character and it just adds a personality to, to your abstract. The fifth section should be a conclusion. So the conclusion should be very concise, very clear, very short. So I would say no more than one to, again, no more than one to two sentences. You want to make sure that you've portrayed the significance of the study. What is the main takeaway point that you want to um, leave the reader with when they finish reading this abstract? And what is, what is that one sentence that you would say adds to the current knowledge of what's known in your topic. So in our case, it says, our findings indicate that the bulk of the actin cortex is nucleated by diaphanous and up to three, um, and that is the main takeaway. So if you go back, if we look back at the introduction, it says that despite its importance, our knowledge is, po is poor and the proteins nucleating it remain unknown. So what we said was, we don't know what proteins nucleate it. And then in the conclusion, we said, actually, the bulk is nucleated by MDIA1 and ARP23. So you can see straight away that story has been told. We don't know what nucleates it, and now we do. Amazing. <laughs> However, there is one more section that I want to add as well, and that is the implications or the future work. Now, in our abstract, we don't necessarily, I would say, have that, but it's because our topic is quite sort of microbiology, sort of biology based. And so it's not something that you can just run away with and start clinical trials for, for example. You could say, for example, this is a very important target that could be used to um, for therapy for X, Y, Z. So that, that one finalizing sentence that shows how this topic or how your finding fits into maybe clinical work or maybe um, Thera therapeutics or, or, or something like that. But in, in our case, it doesn't necessarily directly um, lead to anything. So that's that's that. So altogether, you can see that each of those sections, I've given you six sections, each of those sections are approximately two to three sentences with the results being sort of the, the largest section, the most bulkiest section. If you were to stick to this layout every single time, your abstracts will always be amazing. I promise you, it always works. Remember that even though it's only 200 to 250 words, it's the most precious bit of writing that you could include. So do make sure that you take enough time to really think about what your key points are and to really make sure you've taken time to tailor um, the abstract to perfection. <laughs> um, it really is more important than any other section, I would say, in your in your thesis or in your report. I'll link my abstract down below so you can take a look at it, but really you can look at any abstract. It should be in the exact same order as what I've just described to you. Um, and don't forget to leave me a comment and let me know if that was helpful. Um, and I'll see you guys in my next one. Bye.